are happy to have with us in the first portion of the program tonight, Jonathan Bidlack. He is director of the governance program at the R Street Institute. And a lot of things to talk about tonight. And uh, I think it might be interesting just to start off with the whole notion of uh, whether or not it, it really works to throw money at a problem. Although let me hasten to add that if anyone considers me a problem, uh, you may make an exception in my case and throw money at me. But uh, in general, the uh, the COVID-19 relief uh, bill, the infrastructure bill, and uh, that sort of thing, uh, a good place to start, I think, uh, Jonathan. Uh, I mean, money must surely do something, doesn't it? Well, I mean, uh, t- first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, sure. I guess, uh, sure, sure. I mean, we all we all need money, right? We all need uh, yeah. we all need to make a living. But uh, I think the the question is, of course, as uh, as Milton Friedman said years ago, that you know, when you're when you're spending someone else's money, you're uh, you're not going and uh, and paying quite as close attention to it as you are your own money. And I think that's the big problem that we have when we talk about government spending is that you know we have politicians who are spending money that's not their own. Uh, on, on frankly, people who aren't themselves either. And uh, so the accountability in, in that kind of environment um, is very, very important. And uh, so that's, I think, a big part of the problem that we've had over the last year is that any time you have literally trillions of dollars going out the door, um, you know, you have to – you have to really think about oh, what are we getting in return for that money. And no doubt the last year was, you know, a, I think a, a very special case where no one really doubted that there was there was a need for some sort of federal intervention, given the, the sort of historic, uh, you know, problem we were facing. But, you know, you can't maintain that historic level of emergency spending forever. And, uh, you know, we're at a very different position now than we were a year ago. And I think we should start acting like it. Yeah, I think those are all uh, extremely good uh, points to consider. And in particular, if you just put things in some context here, consider this context. Republicans, uh, regarding their proposed infrastructure bill, have been accused of being cheap by proposing $568 billion. Whatever happened to uh, Everett Dirksen's line, a billion here, a billion there, pretty soon you're talking real money. (laughs) <laughs> it's so true, you know, and 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 uh, you know, you point out a big part of the problem is that you know, there there may be times where where you know one party wants to spend more than the other, but of course, you know, Republicans have spent a lot in the last year as well. I mean, you know, lest we forget, I mean, you know, uh, President Biden only took office in January, and a lot of this spending that we saw in the COVID era, you know, like it or not, is going to be the legacy of the last president and the last Congress. And and so, you know, it's it's also it's a very tough situation politically, I think, for Republicans at the moment, because, you know, they, they they've lost a lot of credibility by not really, uh, uh, you know, having you know, a good watch over the over the purse strings of the country when they were in power. And so, you know, now they sort of find themselves in a position where, you know, their only real option is to try to propose a little bit less, uh, you know, and it's in this case, it's it's significantly less. But. Um, but you know that's still that's still problematic, and so uh, and 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 you know at, at the end of the day, of course, there's this bigger question, which is what is the federal role? What should the federal government ultimately be spending on? And you know that's uh, that's a question that that neither party really seems to want to address. No, they, they, it's much easier, of course, to put things on the gross national credit card, which is unfortunately one of the few areas of bipartisan agreement in Washington these days, and that is that the national debt doesn't really matter that much. Well, uh, you know, of course, it was Dick Cheney some years ago who basically said that, that, you know, deficits don't matter anymore. And I think that, uh, you know, in recent years, again, it seems like both parties have really taken that to heart. I mean, I think it's um, I, I will say this, and this is maybe, a you know, a controversial opinion for someone who's fiscally conservative. But, you know, it's not just about the national debt. I mean, when when the government is spending this amount of money and they're putting it on that credit card, yes, that has an impact down the road. But there's also money coming out of the private sector economy today to pay for stuff that may not be as efficient or create as many jobs, for example, as having that capital available to entrepreneurs in the private sector. And so, you know, I think sometimes everyone focuses just on the national debt. And and don't get me wrong, it's a huge problem and it's a huge risk that we end up finding ourselves into, you know, moving out of the COVID crisis and into some sort of some sort of debt crisis. But even if we don't, there are very real economic costs that accrue in the short term, and and that we're we 
all end up being harmed by. And I think we need to focus on on that kind of you know uh, uh, you know that that wisdom that Ronald Reagan used to talk about back in the day that there there are huge costs to government spending, and you know that's that's the true tax that we all ultimately pay. Uh, it would be helpful, I think, if we did uh, try to focus on on that. And uh, it's uh, it's extremely unfortunate that uh, we are in an era when uh, that doesn't seem to to matter to a great many people. One thing I must confess, I have not understood. The federal government is soaking up more and more lending dollars, right, left, and sideways. Granted, some of it comes from other countries, but not all of it. Given the fact that the federal government is borrowing so much, why are interest rates not at near record lows, but why aren't they at 15, 17, 20 percent? Yeah, well, I mean, of course, that is that is the risk at some point that that may happen. But of course, the uh, the challenge here is that you know the federal government uh, the federal government ultimately controls the money supply, um, and so you know it's not perfect control, but uh, you know they, uh, they they have they have that ability. And the other important thing, by the way, from an economic standpoint to consider is that. You know, people always say, you know, well, why don't we have this debt crisis here? Or they, you know, they look at things like, you know, uh, uh, you know, what is things that have happened in other countries through the years. But many times the United States is still, amazingly enough, you know, in a better fiscal position than than, say, the European Union is or the UK is or some of these other places in the world. And so a big part of it is that when investors decide, you know, or, or think about where they want to put their money, they're not looking at the United States in isolation. They're looking at it, you know, in relation to all of these other places. And the reality is that, you know, interest rates are driven by, by you know, whether or not investors uh, are willing to go and purchase your debt. And so long as the United States, you know, uh, finds itself in a in a better position uh, than than you know some of these other developed places in the world. There's there's still going to be investors, you know, particularly in historical you know years, the Chinese and the Japanese who are willing to go and park their park their savings in in U S dollars, and so that's kept interest rates low. And and you know and and the second factor, of course, is that you know the United States is a very educated workforce. We are still incredibly productive, and so you know the the idea is that you know the United States obviously has sort of uh, economic capacity in the future that that you know people are essentially you know paying for access to but you know that's not inevitable that it's going to last forever and i hate to sound like you know the the, the person trying to go and you know predict of course when the you know when that will come to an end, and if I knew that, I'd probably uh, be running my own hedge fund rather than rather than working in, in policy. But I think that what we do know is that at some point, right, if we continue on this path that we're on, um, it really isn't sustainable, and that's the and that's the big that's the big fear. And, and of course, you know, nobody really knows the answer to that question, and yeah. uh, and that's that's perhaps the worst part of all. It it is, I think, uh, the worst part of all. I remember, of course, what Winston Churchill said about democracy, that it is the worst form of government except <laughs> for all the others. And sometimes I think that the dollar is the world's reserve currency. Uh, it's the uh, because it's the, the, the worst possible reserve currency except for all the others. I think that's exactly right. And, you know, and you see, I mean, if you look at what's happening in capital markets, I mean, you know, people are looking for alternatives. I think, you know, the, the, the United States, I think it's important to say that the dollar is not not necessarily the only reserve currency. It's just the most dominant reserve currency. I mean, there are transactions that take place in you know uh, in in other in other currencies in the world. It's just that the United States, largely for you know historical reasons, but also because of the the state of the U.S. economy, uh, ends up being more more dominant. But um, you know, look that again. You know that uh, over time, if we if we don't maintain the sort of fiscal fiscal responsibility and the, the strong, you know, fiscal stewardship that we've had over the course of the last, you know, 70, 70 or so years in the post-World War II era, um, that is what ultimately puts our economic well-being at, at risk. And so, um, you know, that, that of course, is the fear. And, and when we're in an environment like we've been in now where it seems like, you know, people are willing to just assume that there's no long-term cost or short-term cost to this these insane levels of spending um, – all that does is accelerate us down down that path and make it that much harder in the future to be able to right the right the fiscal ship. More to come, and uh, we'll talk about some other items in the news as well. Uh, Jonathan Bidlack, again, our guest, director of the governance program at the R Street Institute. They're online at the letter R, the word street dot org, R S T R E E T dot org. One eight six six five zero seven is our.